let, let me share with you how I, uh, how I do scripture. You might say how I, uh, uh, if I was at a seminary or something like that, I would say how I do theology. How I do theology. Um, I go to the word of God believing that it is the word of God. Um, it's the word for living. Uh, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. And there's a verse that really just, it, it caught my emotion uh, after I came to Jesus Christ. Or better yet, during that period that the Holy Spirit was convicting me and that I gave my life to Jesus Christ. It was that Hebrew verse where it says the word of God is living, it is powerful, it is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing of sun, of soul and spirit, and joints and mars, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. One of my greatest thoughts growing up without a mother, growing up without a father in my life, was this idea of, of being loved or whether I was worthy of being loved. And so I think my greatest desire, and I think that would build into my motivation uh, for, you might say, for economic success, was based on I, society all around me would say, if you get all of these things, people would love you. And I think that was a driving force in my life, this desire to be loved. And the morning that I gave my life to Jesus Christ, what got me, and I believe that God meets us at our desires of our heart, our longing, I think Christ fulfills that longing of the heart. That's when it really becomes good news. It's become good news to you because it meets your longing. It, it, it meets, it, he fulfills uh, that completeness in us. I think we was created to know God. And I think there is something all around us is, is, is putting on us that we might know God. Know God. And so that morning when I heard that Galatians 2.20 where Paul said I was crucified. He was trying to explain his own behavior. And I'm trying to find out his own behavior. What makes this guy who was a radical murderer give his life to Christ and then wants to live his life out uh, uh, sharing that message with others. What was the motivation behind that? And he said, I was, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, he says, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves me who loves me and who loved me and gave himself for me. That morning, I think the longing of my heart was the fact that there is a God in heaven and that God loves me personally. That was good news. I hadn't had a mother to, to, to hold me in her arm and to nurture me, to tell me that I was okay, that I was loved. That morning, I felt absolutely embraced by God. As I say, I, I, I get the feeling of what the Apostle Paul felt on that Damascus Road. In, in, that, in that book of Philippians, he says that I was apprehended. Uh, he was, that God struck me down and put his arms around me and embraced me and told me that I was loved by him. That's what Paul said. But I, then Paul says that I may know him you know, Paul, in response to God loving him, he wanted to feel that embrace again. And so the rest of Paul's life was sort of lived out like that. That, that I'm going to embrace God the way he embraced me on that road. I'm going to love him the way he loved me. That's what Christianity ought to be. Because that's the message from heaven is that God loves us that we have been loved by God. And now we want to love God back. And how do we love God back? Well, he tells us that. As much as we are doing it for the least of these my disciples, you are loving God back. 
Serving the poor is not some do-good thing. It's, 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 it's because we have been loved. And they have been deprived in many unjust ways for participating in God's creation. And so as I desire is to involve them in the creation again. And so we reach out with them. And we don't reach out just with, just with charity, but reach out with real love and affirmation. Believe that the love that changed me and turned me around, that same love can turn them around. And so the message that we are bringing to the poor and to society is a message that they have been loved by a holy God. And we are extension of that love. And that we are the ones who got the beautiful feet, who are bringing the good news of the gospel to them. And so, the word of God. And so what CCDA is an attempt, this is not just a social do-good movement. This is a movement here of trying to obey the word of God. It is not just they that hear the word will be blessed, but they that do the word will be blessed. So I'm preaching here this morning and preaching for a purpose. CCDA is living out our lives for a purpose. We're trying to obey God. We're trying to do God's will. We're trying to be the church. We're trying to be the continuation of the body of Christ, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. We are trying to be his replacement here on earth. So as he was, so are we in the world. And so we are here to seek and to do the will. I don't like people who come up to me and talk to me about they, all, they know all about what the will of God is. I know a lot of folks do that. They'll talk my ear off. I, I, I'm, I'm not comfortable with knowing the will of God. I, I am forever seeking seeking to do the will of God and I need the Holy Spirit to help lead me and guide me and I know myself too well I'm over anxious I'll do things uh, that's not quite right so I need the Holy Spirit to lead and guide me I'm searching I desire to do the will of God I don't absolutely know it but I'm seeking for it I'm seeking to know the will of God and the place that I look at is in the Word of God and I look at the precedents in the Bible. I look at, uh, I go to the Bible with my burden. What is my burden? What is my concern? What do I feel that I'm concerned about? And then I go to the scripture, and then I try to find scripture in there that is sort of relevant to my problem. And then I try to read that and try to understand it. If, if I can, get some principles from it. And then I say, now, oh, I'm going to teach this. I'm going to teach this other. Because uh, I'm taking the principles. I'm trying to live out the word of God. The Bible said, as he was, so are we in the world. Jesus becomes our example. And the Old Testament writers and the apostles, that's important that we understand. that they, And that's my, my purpose here now is that uh, I believe that people have shaped their own religion, this Christian religion, apart from looking at Jesus. I, I believe that we have sort of shaped a religion based upon our own needs and imagination. I, I think that's what stimulates prosperity theology. It is, it is God for me. I think we have over-individualized God. Naturally, I know that God saves us individuals. But what God wants us to feel is this deep need for each other so we can be his body, his fellowship here on earth. One of us do not replace Jesus on earth. But the church, the collective body, replaces Jesus on earth. And, and so that we are preaching for unity of a people in a neighborhood, in a community. So they can be the body of Christ in that community. And that those gifts of the Spirit that is talked about in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 can be applied in our lives. And that we saw the need. I'm talking about mobilizing the church for action. And individuals joining themselves to each other. And being Christ's body. 
within, within the community. I, I'm not just for all this. And I think that's what creates all of this sometimes superficial emotion and behavior. Because I think we try to convince the world around us that we individualistically is the church. The church is a collective of people who need each other, who is living together in fellowship, who see themselves as being Christ's body in that neighborhood, in that community. So what I want to do this morning is try to, if I can, clarify what it means to be a Christian. I, I'm sort of looking at that. I, I'm hearing this Da Vinci Code, and I'm hearing all of that, and, and, and I'm watching how the evangelical church is being exploited by people like Gibson and other people and, 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 and these guys, and these guys who are writing the book of virtue and all of that, and they are alcoholics. And, oh, I understand that God can save us and rehabilitate us. I understand all of that. I know God can do all that. But, but, the, but, the, but the evangelical church is being man, manipulated and being many times manipulated by a super charismatic leadership. I think we can over-personalize this stuff. We can make personality cults out of people in our society. And we can get our truth from them instead of getting our truth from the Word of God. So I think what we need to do now is to go back to the Word of God and to see what the Bible has to say about Christianity. And that's what I want to do this morning. I want to talk, try to clarify Christianity. My question would be, what is a Christian? What is a Christian? A Christian is a person that we're going to see this morning that is following Jesus. That is following Jesus. I'm going to do Matthew chapter... 4, begin at verse 12. But there's another verse that I want to use as my takeoff verse. In the Gospel of John, at chapter 10, uh, verse 27, this is a, a, an important passage and incident in the life of Jesus. He, he is doing some of his profound teaching, and he says something like this, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. To be a Christian is to be a follower of Jesus. My sheep hear my voice. And so Christians then should be getting that information out of the life of Jesus and the apostles. The early New Testament church said that they were steadfast in the apostles' teaching. We should always be going back to the nearest of source that we can get. When we are looking for truth, we try to go back to its origination, how it began. Christianity began with Jesus and the apostles. And so it's the apostles' teaching that we need to look at. Not what somebody else said about what somebody else said about Jesus. The idea is that we can know him. That's the uniqueness of Christianity, that we can know God. And then the Holy Spirit comes along, and the primary work of the Holy Spirit is to help us with the Word of God so we can know the will of God. And the Holy Spirit can sort of guide us and lead us into truth and to make Jesus Christ real in our lives. That's what the Holy Spirit, those are the primary works of the Holy Spirit, although the Holy Spirit is God. And that makes the Holy Spirit sovereign. And I can't put no limitation on what the Holy Spirit can do. But the teaching of the Bible gives us some idea that when he, the Spirit, has come, he will lead us and to guide us into truth. He will make Jesus Christ known to us. And so let's go then to our teaching this morning. Uh, we're trying to clarify this morning uh, what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be a Christian. Now, we're, we're, we're getting rid of hearsay we're going back to the scripture, and we're going back close to the original as we can. So let's listen as we read then from um, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, beginning at verse 12. Listen to this, and you got to listen to this because the reading of it is probably much more important than anything I say to you to try to help along. Let's listen to the scripture. This is at the early beginning of Jesus' ministry. It says, verse 12 says, Now when Jesus had heard 
that John was cast into prison, he departed from Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelled in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast, in the borders of where the tribe of Zebulun and the tribe of Naphtali, where they met. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness would see a great light, and to them which sat in the region of the shadow of death, light has sprung up. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting their nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said unto them, Follow me. That's our thought this morning. To be a Christian is to follow Jesus. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fish of the men. And straightway they left their net and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, the sons of James and John, the son of Zebedee. They was in the ship with their father men in their net, and he called them. And immediately they left their ship and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that was taken with different types of disease, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, from Decapolis, from Jerusalem, from Judea, Judea and beyond the Jordan. I hope I made my point. To be a Christian is to follow Jesus, to follow the teaching of Jesus. Jesus did not write a book himself, but it was the, he inspired through the Holy Spirit. These holy men, moved by the Spirit, they observed the life of Christ. And the New Testament is those people who either was apostles with Jesus or the first generation of those who worked with the apostles. That's the Bible we have, we call the New Testament. So we need to go back to that and pick up our cues today and then trying to order our life after Jesus. To be a Christian, then, is to follow Jesus. Now, what has happened? Uh, Jesus has uh, begun his ministry. He begins it after John was put in prison. Now, Jesus have all have had some ministry already. But uh, what had happened was there had become some conflict. John had a, a one task. And John the Baptist's task was to introduce Jesus to the world. And he fulfilled that. And John is still alive. And there came some little competition. And Jesus sort of withdrew from uh, Judea. And he went back up to his home. And then he stays there. And then he hears that John is cast in prison. Now he's ready to go. He understands, because he's God, that that's the end of John. He understands that John is not yet beheaded, but he had been cast in prison. And now Jesus begins his ministry. He, he had already introduced his ministry early on when he went to Nazareth, you remember, and preached. We got that Isaiah 61. And he laid out before us what his mission was going to be about so that we could know that Messiah was here. And his sign and his wonders was going to be evident that he was a Messiah. He was a Messiah. And so he go into the synagogue there and he makes his public announcement. He says, The Spirit of the Lord God Almighty is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted to set at liberty those that are captive, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. 
And now, when the Old Testament prophets look for the Messiah coming, one of the evidence of Messiah coming would be his relationship to the poor. That he would be concerned about the poor. He would be concerned about those that are sick. He was going to be concerned about the helpless people in society. Those who have been disenfranchised, left out. That was going to be the main sign of his coming. Now, James picked that up. James, who was one of the apostles. And they asked James, what is true religion? You know, what is religion all about? What is this new religion y'all talking about following Jesus? What is that all about? John James said, true religion and undefiled before God is this. The visit to offer and the widows, those are the ones who didn't have opportunity. That was the poor. And to keep oneself unspotted before the world. How we live. How we live. There need to be some holiness of living. I know those are old-fashioned words. Those are old-fashioned words. Holiness of living. But as I look back and see most of the revivals that have come about, the people had a passion against the sin of their day. What was the sin of their day? That's what revival has been. Revival has been when people see the overpowering sin of their day. And they began to preach against what is prohibition, whether whatever it is, they, they, they see the sin of their day in society. And they're concerned about the poor in society. That's our identity. That's our identity. To be indifferent to the poor is not to know the God of creation. Not know the God who created us all in his image. And so that would be the sign. He, then he preaches it. And then he waits around there. And he hears that John is put in prison. And this become his time now to start his ministry. Listen to what it says here. Uh, now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departs. That means he leaves. He picks up his bags. He's not going to live in Nazareth anymore. He's now fixing to set his headquarters up, and he's fixing to start his campaign now so that people can know that God has visited the earth. He's fixing to start that. And so he moves to uh, uh, Capernaum. And this is important here. Uh, why did he leave Nazareth, and why did he go, it says here in verse 13, and dwell? That means he sets up his headquarters in Capernaum. Why did he go there? Why did he go there? He went there for two reasons. Two major reasons why he sets up his headquarters in Capernaum. He says so right here in verse 14. He said that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. You know, Jesus somewhat lived his life out in fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah have had the greatest vision of, of the Messiah coming. And if you read and follow Jesus' teaching, he's always doing things in fulfillment of what Isaiah... You see, Isaiah was this great prophet who turned the prophetic word into music. And when you read this guy, he'll say something like this, For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. You can look at Isaiah, and Isaiah is the one who said that when he come, the Spirit of the Lord would be upon him, because he'll have a concern for the poor. And here Isaiah says he's going to Capernaum and set up his headquarters there, because Isaiah the prophet had said it. And so he's setting up his headquarters, and Jesus himself is living in according to the Word of God. And if Jesus Christ came to this earth, and lived in according to the teaching of Isaiah, then how do we think then that we're going to succeed if we're going to build our life on that? In Mississippi, we would say, on who shot Charlie? On hearsay. <laughs> on hearsay. We should get our message from the Word of God. We should get our orders from the Word of God. Jesus got his orders from the Word of God. So he went there, number one. Because the word of God, Isaiah had said he was going there. That was number one. Number two, he went there because this is called Galilee of the Gentiles. Galilee of the Gentiles. Around Capernaum 
And that part of the Sea of Galilee had become the retreat center for the rich. It was like Carmel in California. It was where the rich had built their retreat centers, their, their, their second or third home there. And the Jewish people in the nation, that was their headquarters. Well, God had said that uh, the Sabbath day would be the Sabbath day. But these very rich people who had come in there and set up their headquarters there, over the years, they wanted people not only to serve them on the Sabbath day, but they wanted them to serve them all the days of the week. Because the Jews also, if they go over to the Bible, uh, they can't uh, work their servants on the Sabbath. But they would bring in these Gentiles. And of course, when you start bringing in immigrants, pretty soon they become the big population. They brought us over here as immigrants, and we've been a problem. <laughs> brought us over here as slaves. <laughs> now we are bringing the Hispanics over, and they're becoming a problem. <laughs> to, so, 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 so Galilee of the Gentile is where all of these Gentiles had come. Because the Jewish people, this was the one place on earth where these people, the richest people, intentionally kept these people in the dark. The people who had the light would not share the light with their servant because to share the light with the servant would convert them and they would be proselytized Jews. And so this is here, the darkest spot on earth. It's a place where the wealthy and the powerful intentionally kept the word of God away from people. And so Jesus sets up his headquarters in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sit in darkness but see a great light. And they that sit in the region of the shadow of death, light has shown. And if Jesus is going to heal a lot of sick people, he's going to cast out a lot of devils, he's going to do a lot of it because these people have been deprived of opportunity, of medical care, and all these other services in that community. So he sets up his headquarters there. So the first point, you say, if I'm going to make a point here, he's there. We've answered the question of why he's there. If we're going to do ministry, I was down in Jamaica and having us conference, we was trying to spread Christian community development there with some pastors. And every morning I was teaching. And uh, we started talking about, uh, we was at uh, Montego Bay. And uh, we were in a pretty nice place where we was living, pretty nice. And I, naturally we wanted to know, you know, where was the poor. And we started talking about the poor. And boy, they had a place for us. They had a place where... It was no hope. There is a place in Montego Bay. The situation looks absolutely hopeless. And when I talk with some of my friends who are here now, and they're going to talk here after a while, and we went into that place. First, we went up and looked at it, looked down at it, and then uh, I wasn't satisfied with that. <laughs> I had to go down and walk in that village and talk to these people there. And the reason that we want to encourage a development of a CCDA component in Jamaica uh, is because we went into that village. We went into the darkest spot. You'll know when our light is shining. We'll know when our light is shining that we go to the poor. We'll know that the light is shining out. That's what Wayne Gordon says when he went to Lundale, the 15th poorest section of the country. The light is beginning to shine in Lundale. The light began when he began to win some of those young people to Jesus Christ. And they started a little church there. And when he started sending them off to college, and those young folks and the people in that community began to decide what their needs was. And they began to respond to the needs of those people in that community in that neighborhood. They believed in the inherited dignity of the people. And we can do something in this neighborhood to make a difference. And so we're in that. 
Right. So within the place, the first thing you have to do is relocate. Go to the place of need. Set up a station in the place of need. Okay, so Jesus is located in his place. That's the first step. He's in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who are sitting in darkness is going to see a great light. Unto them that sit in the region of death, light is fixing to shine out. Verse 17 then says, now that he's there, now that headquarters is set, now he begins to, this is what it said, and from that time, Jesus began to preach. Let's look at the content of his preaching. That's the first thing. You know, sometimes I go and I say to people, they'll say, man, the preacher showed not preach. I said, what did he say? I don't know what he said, but he really preached. That's talk. The gospel has a message. The gospel have a central message. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And so, what is the message for sinners? What do sinners have to do? They have to repent. They have to repent. And, and so, the gospel, ha the gospel is good news to those people who are longing for a better life who have some sense that they are messed up and they need a new life and that Jesus come so they might be born again and the way you're born again is that unless you repent unless you repent you got to say to God what God already know about you that's what it means to repent it's to say, that's what it means to confess confessing is telling God what he already know that you're a sinner that's, that's our message. That's our message. The art of preaching is this. The art of preaching is this. How do you present the love of God in a way that brings about repentance without condemning the hearer? That's the art of preaching. The prophets couldn't do that. The Old Testament prophets couldn't do that. Jesus brought a new art into the world. And that new art was preaching, and the Apostle Paul took that art and carried it throughout the world. And that's why he could say, for the preaching of the cross are to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. I'm not ashamed of this gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to bring about salvation and conversion. And so... That's the content of preaching. That's a good way you can evaluate preaching. Is preaching bringing people? Is it presenting the love of God in a way that people can see their sin and turn from their sin and turn to a holy good God and feel that their sins have been taken off from their back in society? And so that preaching has content. And so Jesus begins to preach and begin to say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so, number one is, we got to get plays. Number two, we got to have good content. Number three, then, we got to begin a discipleship. Discipleship program of discipling people. Boy, I got it in Africa. I got the truth of discipleship in Africa. Spencer and, 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 and Derek and I was in Africa, in Kenya. And we were way up there in Nakura. And we was living with some Christian, and uh, and Spencer, this 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 man was a, a, a good farmer, and his joy was is how many people his farm could work. He saw his farm as providing employment for the people, and he sort of bragged about that. Uh, you know, God gave me this land, and what I want to use it for is employment. And, and you know, if I manage it good, I'm going to make some money in return. But it was his employees that he was concerned about. And they had this one little girl, and she'd come over from Tanzania, and a lot of them was coming over from Tanzania because uh, they're very poor, uh, just, just almost an orphan girl, and she worked there. And she was so attractive. That's probably why Spencer and I was talking to her about it. And it was, he, Spencer, Spencer, he wasn't married then. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he said, uh, said uh, they was talking to her about this, this young, attractive girl. They were there. And Spencer said to her, to the lady of the house, uh, is she a Christian? She says, uh, no, she is going to our church. 
and she has joined the church but now we are teaching her how to be Christian I like that I like that I think we put too much into that first conversion I think conversion sets us up for discipleship and just because a person was converted they might give out a, a, a message that is not correct and so what we need to do is disciple the nation. Jesus sent us into the world not just to get converted. But after we get converted, so we'll disciple the people. So that they can grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Jesus went about making disciples. I go skip that. And then let me bring it to a conclusion. Here. In verse 14. And his fame, he went out preaching the gospel healing the sick, caring for the people around him in society. And then verse 6, uh, verse 25 says, this is our final verse, and they followed him. These are the believers. These people who followed him. Let's look at where they followed him and i close with that. Some people say, did the gospel go across racial and culture barriers? The Apostle Paul understood that so well. He said in the body of Christ there is no room to accommodate racism and bigotry. It's not compatible with Christianity. Because we are created in the image of God. And God came to save the world from sin. And that Jesus was an international preacher from the beginning. And he sent his disciples into all the world. Not to make them some racial bigots. Not to let them set up churches based on their ethnicity. But establish his body in that community. And whosoever will would let them come to Christ. Christ was an international preacher. We can see that here. As I can see. Reconciliation is at the absolutely center of the gospel. And that we have allowed racism to damage that message in society. Racism is just one little part of the completeness of the gospel. Or might say of the fullness of the gospel. Paul puts it so well, he said that God was in Christ reconciling all things unto himself. And that we have made the race thing so big that we threw out the baby with the bathwater. And now we discover reconciliation. That's how you were saved. That's how you were saved. The gospel reconciles us to God and to each other. We know that we are reconciled because we love each other in society. And listen to what it says as I finish. It says, And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, from Decapolis. Decapolis was ten little Hong Kong types of cities on the other side of the Jordan. It was, it was, it was, a, it was a multiracial place. That's why they call it Decapolis. It was ten cities. These was little nation cities with different ethnic groups in the Decapolis. And so Jesus went there and the people from And the people from Decapolis is from those ten cities. Those ten Hong Kong type nation cities. It's like Singapore. It's like a, a nation, they were little nation cities with different nationalities living there. And so they have followed him. The people from uh, Decapolis. And this is important here, Decapolis. And from Jerusalem and from Judea and from Syria these are not just Jews Jesus was not a bigot Jesus came to reconcile the world to himself and so if we're going to follow Jesus we have to carry this gospel into all the world the mission of the church 
is to be stewards of this good news. Good news of the gospel. And this good news of the gospel is for the world. Uh, that's my teaching for this morning. Okay.